Good morning. Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas, Breaking Ground. This is Pavel, and he'll be giving a talk on BIMCA, Electron Post Exploitation When the Land is Dry. But first, a few announcements. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors and volunteers without whom this event couldn't happen, uh, especially Critical Stack and uh, Valmail and Amazon and BlackBerry and the NSA. Um, these talks are being streamed uh, and recorded, so please uh, don't use your cell phones. Um, and uh, if you have questions, Pavel, do you want questions during your talk or oh, after? Yeah. If you have questions, raise your hand and I will bring the microphone over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pavel Sakalidis, and I'm a senior consultant for Context Information Security, which is based in London. So before I begin, when I was making the presentation, I was given two pieces of advice. One advice was that I should start with a joke. And the second advice was that I should practice, I should record the whole thing, and then I should just do the circle again and again until I'm happy with the result. But by recording my presentation and listening back to it, I, what happened was that I heard my own voice, and I, hear, I heard how I sound to the outside world. So instead of starting with a joke, I'll start with an apology because I have no control over my voice. Um, having said that, today I'll be talking about electron post exploitation uh, when the land is dry, and I will introduce a tool as well that, that does the whole process a bit easier. So let's assume that. On the red, you, are, you are on a red team job, you have done your phishing campaign and somebody just opens the Word document and you get a beacon back. The next sensible step would be to just try and find a way to persist on the system. But let's assume that the, um, the endpoint is running some sort of endpoint, endpoint protection that you've never heard of, never seen before in your life, and just blocking most of the things you try to do to kind of start it like on, on when the machine boots. That is where electron applications come into play. And I will start straight away with a demo to, dis to display how, um, how it works in action, and then we're gonna decide, discuss how it actually, how, how it, it can be exploited. So on the right-hand side, we have the victim. On the left-hand side, we have the listener that the attacker has um, set up. At this point, the user will just, let's assume the application is backed or don't pay attention to, this, to the command line. And when they log in, we will see that on the left, we get a reverse shell back. This run, runs Ubuntu and we can see that Skype runs without any sort of warnings. However, we get, get a shell back. This, this works across all operating systems as, as long as the application is built with Electron. So now we're gonna see how actually um, we can achieve that. These are some popular applications, desktop applications that have been built with Electron. Uh, you might, the, the ones that stand out is uh, Slack, Signal, Visual Studio Code, and Skype. In this instance, it, wor it, it is worth mentioning that Skype has three versions. One version is Skype for Business. This one is not built with Electron. Second version is the one that's built uh, in the Windows 10 App Store, and that as well is not built with Electron. The third one is the one you download on the website, and that's the one that's built with Electron. So that's the only one that's vulnerable um, across uh, the, the operating systems. So what exactly is Electron, and why do more and more companies use it? It's, uh, it practically runs Node.js in the back end and Chrome in the front end. And it's effectively Chrome in the box. So any electron you have running, any electron application you have running, it's practically a Chrome browser running alongside everything else. And it was developed by GitHub about 2013, and I, I think their first big project was Atom, the Atom browser, the Atom uh, code editor. Sorry. So why do why do more and more companies use it? Well, the answer is quite obvious: is because it's cost effective. You have to just write it once and then cross compile across the operating system you want it. Uh, you want to offer support, and then you can. Um, you don't. Need, you do not need to hire software developers. You can just 
use the code you use on your website, and then you just put it on the Electron application, and that's it. So this is an example of how Skype looks like. You can practically open Skype and press Control, Shift, and I, and it, the developer console will open. So you can see there are, uh, this is the inspector, elements, network uh, manager. It, it's effectively Chrome. That, that, that's pretty much what, what it is. So to understand what makes this attack possible, we'll have to discuss how it actually works, how Electron works. Electron is based on ASR files, which ASR files is another format of a compressed archive like zip or tar or anything like that. So when you double click on an app, the first thing it does, it just runs um, Chromium and Node.js, it kind of spins that up, and then what it does it, is it loads its bootloader. It's easier to understand it that way from electron.asr. Once the environment is ready, because electron.asr, that's what it does is, is it prepares the whole environment for the application to be loaded. Once that's done, app.asr is loaded, which is effectively the source code of the application. If you open app.asr, it's effectively a web root. There's an index.html file, which you just, uh, that's, that's the file that's loaded, and then everything else is loaded after that. Here are some facts about ASR files. They're not encrypted, they're not signed, they're not scanned by AV software, although uh, zip archives are scanned in RAR and ACE and TAR and everything else. However, ASR files are not, and they're not even encrypted. And the last and most important one, and is the reason why this whole presentation came to be, is that there are no integrity checks in place to make sure that once you install something, that it's right there, they, right there in the, in the format that it should be. So here I made an example file where I took the ACAR test file and just put it in an archive and uploaded the virus total. And from the 50 odd uh, engines, only five of them have identified it. And I was quite surprised that Baidu, like China, has that already. They, they are already scanning that, those, those kind of files. And I think three out of those five um, products are from China. So might make someone think, like, why do Chinese people just scan that and nothing else does? So developers are weird creatures. We try and protect the source code and hide the source code, make sure nothing is changed, nothing is edited, modified, or whatever. However, there have been a lot of developers coming, coming fr um, front and saying, can we encrypt the source files or protect source files or do something that someone might not be able to change the source files? And the destiny of all those issues is they end up closed because they say, well, no, if you want to do it, you have to do it yourself. This is how Electron works and this is how it will work. So the tool, I believe pretty much all of us here have at some point written a script or um, a tool or some sort of application and then once we have it, we have to find a really cool name about it. I went the other way. I always had Bimka because I had a teddy bear called Bimka when I was young and I really wanted to use this name. So I have almost managed to make it happen. So at the moment, Bimka stands for Basic Electron Exploitation modular, and then I will need your help on the KA, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to accept any recommendations afterwards, but I will reward anyone that has some sort of suggestions with a beverage of your own choosing. I'm happy to bribe people to get it working. And uh, out of the box, at the moment, what it does is you can install key loggers, take screenshots of the application or the entire desktop, you can inject operating system commands, access uh, devices, and you can create targeted modules for applications. I think the most interesting part of that is the targeted modules. And here we're gonna see an example where an attacker can egress source, file, source code files from Visual Studio Code. Once again, on the right, there's the attacker's endpoint and on the left is the developer that just runs Visual Studio Code. As you can see, no warnings, nothing came up, everything's fine. And then the developer starts opening uh, extend, uh, files. This module is designed to only exfiltrate open tabs rather than the whole directory structure. 
So you can see that on the right, uh, files beginning to appear, and those are the ones that have been opened by the, the developer. And by just clicking on a file, we can see its contents. If someone wanted to take this a step further, they could just inject the file in the source code. And because probably Visual Studio Code has everything already unlocked and ready for the developer to use, they can just do a git commit and just push to master. Well, assuming that that company doesn't have code reviewing process and all that. But if someone is not careful enough, you may end up with code in your production environment that, that shouldn't be there. So once I, I, may, I, I build the tool, I was like, I'm gonna play it safe. I'm just gonna contact the Electron team and tell them, this is what, what I did, this is the reason how it came to be, do you think it should be fixed or if something should be done? And this is the response I got from them. <laughs> yes, the slide is empty because I got no response at all. So at that, at that, ca at that moment I said, okay, okay, fair game, it's not a bug, it's a feature, so I'll just keep going with the whole process. So how does it actually work? I really hope at this point I could say that there's some magic that was done and that I did something cool and I found a really cool trick or something. No, there's nothing like that. You can just take Electron.asr, just unpack it, modify a file, put your payload, and then pack it again, and that's the end of it. So when you unpack Electron.asr, there are a lot of um, files, files that, that can be used. I will have them, thank you. One bowl of no yellow M&Ms. Why not? <laughs> oh, did I put that in? <laughs> yeah, so apparently I put in as a requirement that I don't want yellow M&Ms. And it actually happened. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and there are, there are a lot of files that someone can, can edit to inject their payload in. However, I found that the most reliable one is Chrome extension.js. Um, so Electron offers a number of API, or a number of event listeners that you can just trigger when the application loads. One of them is application ready or window created. The way it works is you run Chrome, you run the Electron app, that's the application, then you run, you open a window and then you have the web contents. That, that's kind of format of it is. And then you just pack the file and put it in its place and then wait for the user to run uh, the application. This is some basic functionality that Bimka has. One is to unpack or pack a file if, in case you want to not unpack Electron, just unpack the application itself and see what it does and maybe find an XSS that wasn't there, that, that nobody knew was there, just whatever you want to do. And then there's the injection where you could just take a module and inject it inside um, Electron. When you run inject, you don't have to run unpack, inject, pack. You just can do inject and it does everything for you. Also at this point, I would like to also say that I hope there would be sufficient documentation on how to write your own module at this point. However, there isn't. So if you wanna build a module, just have a look at the existing modules and see how, the, how those work and try and figure it out or just drop me a line and I will have to help you. So this is what Electron ASR file looks like. A lot of folders, a lot of um, JavaScript files, and you can do whatever you want with it. So payloads. Does anyone here hate JavaScript with a passion like I do? <laughs> yeah. If someone has never used JavaScript, imagine Java and PHP getting together, having a stroke, <laughs> And then having another stroke, okay, I'm gonna leave it at two strokes. That's what JavaScript is. So all payloads are written in JavaScript, all of them. And there are two, ty two ways you can execute something from Electron. One of them is from within the context of the application, so you just inject JavaScript inside the application. And the other one is within the context of Electron, so that's kind of one step behind on the Node.js level. So here's how the application's context injection works. It's plain on JavaScript. Whatever works in Chrome will work in Electron. 
you can just, instead of trying to find an XSS endpoint, an XSS vulnerability and exploit that, you can just inject it straight away inside the application. And long story short, if you just want to load the whole jQuery and update the whole, the whole interface of the application, you can do that. And then there are extra bits that you can call from within the application's context that will give you more functionality like read files or access devices. The Visual Studio Code egress that we saw is from the application's context. So you would just code inside that was just running on intervals, checking when a file is open, and then reading the file system, getting the file, and exfiltrating it back. There are some restrictions, though. So if the application is using CSP headers, you will not be able to do any post requests, any uh, AJAX requests back to your, uh, to your endpoint. Those obviously can be bypassed by updating host file, but then the game is in a whole different level, and it's not just in that application. And um, so Skype, for example, is using CSP headers, but it's not using it in the HTTP headers, it's using it within a meta tag, which I couldn't find a way to bypass. So Electron offers you some sort of API manipulation techniques that you can just remove HTTP headers, but it doesn't allow you to update the file that's coming, uh, updating half the file, half the response. And then we have web views that cannot be accessed. Web views is like a sandbox that runs on a different process ID within Electron. Slack, in this case, is using web views, so you cannot install something within the application's context. You can't install a keylogger, because the keylogger is effectively J uh, JavaScript that just does on key up and just grabs all the, uh, all the keystrokes. But that does, that does not mean that you cannot execute anything within the uh, Electron's context, like a reverse shell, like Skype, for example. Because the Skype backdoor was not in the application's context, it was in the Electron's context. So here's how the Electron context's um, payload work. It's still JavaScript, Node.js this time, and there is more functionality of the perspective of the server. So you can intercept or block HTTP requests. This means that when the application runs and the, it checks if there are new updates, what you can do is you can either block that request and then the application will think that, okay, I'm on the latest and greatest version, no need to update. Or you can spoof that whole request and then re redirect the user to an update that's yours. Um, in this case, that would be, I think, more dangerous because that way someone might just install with administrative 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 okay privileges uh, a backdoor a new backdoor and then another interesting bit is that you can because it's still a browser that's running if it tries to communicate with an endpoint that has self-signed certificates it will not it will, it will just stop you it will just say sorry it, it just doesn't work there are event handlers that are triggered every time something doesn't work uh, like, uh, for example, the, the certificates, and you can just uh, instruct it to bypass that. So if you have an endpoint that is just an IP address and you can't install a valid SSL certificate, you can just install this event handler and your request will go through. Now, what do you need to make this work? Well, obviously, you need local access, like we discussed in the scenario with the red team before, and you need right access to the installation folder. On Windows, it's easier because if an Electron installer detects that you are a low privilege user, it will just install in the application data and therefore you have access to write in that, in that directory. But most installers also, also uh, offer you the, the capability to install across the whole system when in that case it will go to program files, which makes life a little bit more difficult. On Linux and Macs, because you need elevated privileges to install something, it's not, uh, it, it will be a little bit more complicated. Now, ways to exploit, and this is where it gets interesting. So, you can run operating system commands and you can do anything you want. However, the executable is not modified. So, the hash of the file of the slack.exe or skype.exe or vscode.exe remains exactly the same. So, what it does is, is you just instruct a totally legit application to run something that you want it to run, and it's just gonna do it. 
Therefore, we have gone to great lengths to uh, create app locker and whitelisting and blacklisting and all that kind of thing and memory in memory patch protection and reverse engineering protection and encrypting the exe files and everything and then you have something like this where you just leave the application as is but then you can just run whatever you want on the side another uh, valid attack would be to uh, redis redistribute a malicious application that way someone will just download the installer but the installer will obviously not be signed However, how many times did we actually check if something is signed? You just click the yes button and it just installs. And then, but the end, but the installed application, like slack.exe, will still be signed. Therefore, it will bypass um, any whitelisting uh, restrictions you have or anything you have on that box. Another interesting um, way to attack something is you get you, you gain access to data that you previously did not have access to. For example, passwords within a password manager or uh, messages within Slack. And last but not least, you can spy on the user using a web camera, screenshots, or microphone, or whatever you want. Someone might argue here that this is called gathering intel on the target. Society calls this stalking, and it's not cool and should be avoided at all costs. So here's an example of how we can egress stored passwords within Bitwarden. Does anybody use Bitwarden? Nice. Don't use the desktop app. So here again, on one side we have the user, and on the other side we have the attacker's endpoint. As we can see, the user will just unlock their vault, which we don't care about this password because we, it's what's inside that counts, and just once unlocked, everything will be egressed back to the attacker. And as simple as that, you have just lost all your passwords because you installed a desktop app that has been somehow uh, backdoored. Obviously, this doesn't work on the web versions of, uh, of those apps. So what do these next generation applications try to achieve? The first thing is bring the web to the desktop. I say leave the web in the web, but okay, fine. If, the, if, if companies want to save money just building everything with JavaScript, that's fine with me. The, store, the source code is, sto is stored locally. Again, that's fine with me, but it shouldn't be fine to not perform integrity checks on, uh, on your files because you expect you're running something and then you have no control over, over what, in what format it is now if it, if it has been backdoored. Another important thing is that you introduce a whole range of, of web vulnerabilities to the desktop. If you have an XSS attack, XSS vulnerability on a website, it's highly unlikely that you will be affected on some other website. Most of the time, it's just affected on that specific website, unless someone drops a zero day, which if someone drops a zero day to get you, you probably have bigger problems than just using Electron. And then you can also use devices which if you do on the web uh, version of the application, Chrome will just pop up a box saying, do you want me to use the camera or microphone? In Electron, it doesn't. It just says, can I use the camera? Yes, here you go. The light of the camera will turn on, so you're not bypassing that. It's just that you have no idea when that's enabled. Here's an example of how a web vulnerability which we take on Lightly, which is the um, when you when logged in sessions are transferable, which is literally like a low issue. We don't really care about it. But here's how it it could work. So we have a user that's running a vulnerable, not vulnerable, a backdoored version of Slack, and they try to log in. However, this user is quite security aware, and they have. Uh, two-factor authentication as well. So they feel pretty good about themselves. So once putting the 2FA in, the user will be logged in back into, into Slack. At this point, what Slack does, what the backdoor does, it sends all HTTP all cookies and URLs back to the attacker's endpoint. So once someone's logged in, by this, by this point, 
everything has already been sent out to the attacker, and it, and it keeps sending it to the attacker, so nothing stops. And here are all the cookies that have been sent grouped by time. So we pick any of those, and we take the whole cookie. From this cookie, I realize I say cookie quite a lot. So from this cookie, we just need B, D, and X. Next step, so this video was done on the same machine, but it works across IP addresses. It's just easier to do a video on the same box. So what we do is we just recreate the whole, all those three cookies, and we give it access to slack.com and all subdomains. If you don't include all subdomains, you'll just end up in an infinite loop. So once you move all the cookies, yes, I could have written a script to do this quicker, but I'm really good at copy-pasting, and I wanted the whole world to see. So if you look on the top right, it says sign in and get started. Once all three cookies are in place, do you feel the suspense? So once it's refreshed, the top right becomes your workspaces, and by clicking it, you have just gained access to the Slack. To Slack. And because if someone's running a a local version of Slack, when they just shut down their machine, they will not be logged out. It means that you will have access here until the session expires. And if you keep using it, the session will probably not expire. Also, this is a good uh, way to check if developers have uh, shared passwords, API keys, if someone uploaded uh, a legal document or a contract or something, you just access the whole history and just do whatever you want. So how does this, the previous attack, actually work? So one of the API event handlers that Electron offers is the on before send headers, which, is, which means that before any HTTP request is done, it goes through here. So what we do here is I take the URL and the cookie and send it back to the attacker. This way you can just, yes, it does duplicate all HTTP requests, but if we add some logic to it, uh, we could just stop the moment we have everything uh, under control. Also, it's worth mentioning that this happens on the application level, so there is no need to install a system-wide proxy or something that the, the user will um, will notice. Because if, you, if, you, if an attacker does that, it's very transparent. They will never know what's happening. And if my endpoint, instead of example.com, is slackupdates.jp or something, some, some, something strange, it will not be noticed because they will think that, okay, this is a legit Slack endpoint. So what are some ways to protect ourselves? At the moment, there isn't an official fix. However, Electron 6 was released last week, but I didn't have time to check if integrity checks have been implemented. Hopefully, this will change. Another step is to install applications as a high-privileged user. This mostly applies on Windows. However, even by doing that, we can just hope that the attacker does not elevate their privileges. Because once they do, once they have right, folder, right access to the folder, it's game over. Then we can monitor the process tree. This, is, this could work, I think. So if you see slug.exe running PowerShell, you can be, OK, this shouldn't happen. We should investigate. But, but if you look at the right, that's um, a legit Visual Studio Code process tree. So it runs Git, it runs CMD, exe, it runs PowerShell, it runs, it runs everything. So it, it might be quite difficult to identify what happens here. And this will only protect against um, command injection. If an attacker wants to make a CNC server and just use HTTP requests from within the app, you will never know, because that it's Chromium itself that does the, all the requests. And overall, if you can avoid it, don't install the desktop app. And yes, I am talking about Slack. Because if you have the web version of, of something that does exactly the same as the desktop version, at this point, there is no reason to install the desktop version. Just use the web, because the browser will protect you, will sandbox everything, and will let you know if someone tries to access something that they shouldn't. Now, is it just Electron apps that are vulnerable to this? or similar attacks? No, because Spotify is not using Electron, but Spotify is using the Chrome embedded framework, which is bare metal um, Electron. 
And instead of using SR files, they use the so-called SPA files, which stands for Spotify app. However, renaming an SPA file to .zip, you can just extract the file, update index.html, put your hello world in, and that's it. I assume that there could be some interesting attack vectors to be um, tested with Spotify. I haven't done any of that. I just realized that it's vulnerable as well and thought to mention it in, in case someone wanted to use it as homework. So the summary would be Electron apps, if you are on a red team or if you have compromised the host or for whatever reason and you want to, and you want to either um, maintain persistence or if you just want to gain access to applications or data within the applications, you can just use an Electron app that's installed. Most probably you will have some sort of Visual Studio Code or Slack or Signal or something um, like, like that installed on a, a corporate machine. Well, I don't think Signal would be on a corporate machine. But yeah, you, you, you get the point. And fortunately and unfortunately is that this whole thing will stop existing the moment Electron adds an integrity check on those two files. Because the moment they do that, you won't be able to change anything without actually changing the EXE signature, which I think this is the most important part of the whole attack, that yes, if you have uh, pseudo access or admin access on a host, yes, you can do whatever you want. But if you try to, to change an EXE file, you will change it hash. So by changing the hash, you will trigger some sort of al alarms and alerts. In this case, nothing like that happens. The EXE will always stay the same, nothing will change, and you might have already have some sort of backdoor application that you have no idea that's there. And because antiviruses do not check ASAR files, and that, that means that you might have something in those files that will never see the, see, um, the, the light of day. Uh, I was once on an engagement, uh, and once I got a beacon back, I was already running a system. And no matter what I did, they were running some sort of weird well, we had unknown uh, endpoint um, protection, and no matter what I did, it would just block everything. So at that moment, I realized they had Slack installed, and I just put the PowerShell um, uh, payload in Slack, and when the user logged in, it would just spawn the, uh, the shell back. So if you want the source code, it's on GitHub. Uh, and I will also be on DEFCON Demo Labs on Friday if you want to come and see it in action or play around with it or ask any questions or make a module, I don't know. Uh, you, can, you can come and have a look. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions or anything you would like me to clarify? I realized this was quite quicker than expected. Hello. Oh. Hi. 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 Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, ha um, I have a question because you mentioned that the uh, CSP headers are, are honored. Yes. Um, from a developer's perspective, from a, an app developer's perspective, yes. uh, is it possible to use something like uh, SRI, sub resource integrity, in order to? verify your JavaScript files inside the application, would that stop an attacker? Because integrity checks on the whole archives, that's something that Electron has to do, right? You can't do it as an application developer, but you can, you could use SRI, I'm thinking, to, to check the JavaScript files within your app. Yes, but I will only protect you with uh, against a specific, um, specific file that you as a developer have inserted in the application, but the attacker can insert their own so it can, it can load something from example.com or attacker.com, which since they inject the, the JavaScript, they will just not put the SRI in and they will just load the file as normal. Thank you for the presentation, it was really nice. Um, I was wondering, uh, at some point you mentioned that this electron is on Node.js, right? Yes. 
So um, have you checked, was it able to access any resources that Node.js Node has access to? For example, I believe it also has an access to file system. Yes, yeah. so the Visual Studio Code example, uh -huh. that was, uh, so the application was calling the Node.js file system, and that's how it's reading the file, and that's how it's sending it back. So anything that Node.js does, it can be accessible. So that means we can actually, like this could be used to exfiltrate uh, any files hosted on that yes. workstation. Yeah. You can create your own browser, like CNC server, and just double click on folders and do whatever you want, yeah. Uh, great talk, thanks Thank so much. So I was just curious, maybe I missed this, for getting a reverse shell like from the electron context, how, how does that exactly work? So you can call, um, actually I can, I can show you, I think it'd be easier. So if you do Linux, for instance. How do I? Does anyone know, anyone know the shortcut? To oh, oh, there it is, there it is. Magic happens. <laughs> Yeah, so you just use the Node.js um, net and child process. Then you just run whatever command, command you want, whichever host, and you can just, as long as you have, if you have a one-liner to do it, you can just use here and it just will work fine. And then you mentioned the, uh, the privilege difference for the installed application. Yes. So how does that protect um, the process? Exactly. So if, let's say, you have, uh, a user just download, uh, double clicks on the phishing email and the attacker gets reverse shell, but they're still running on the same privileges as that user. If Slack was installed in program files, you would not be able to change that file. So that, in, that, in, that, in that essence, it will not, uh, it's more secure, but the moment the, the attacker gets admin or system, it's game over. Okay, awesome, thanks. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference and conferences. Thank you.